welcome you to worship this evening as we celebrate the last of Epiphany, the last service for Epiphany, which also is known as Transfiguration Sunday. Throughout this Epiphany season, we've been focusing on the hidden glory uh, in the life of Jesus, and today that glory is revealed uh, very clearly in his Transfiguration. We're going to follow the printed order of worship that's in your service folder, and also follow along with the screen. Our opening hymn is in 712, Jesus, Take Us to the Mountain. Savior, 
paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, before the suffering and death of your one and only Son, you revealed his glory on the holy mountain. Grant that we who bear his cross on earth may behold by faith the light of his heavenly glory, and so be changed into his likeness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. First lesson for our consideration today as we celebrate the transfiguration of Jesus is taken from the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, where we see one of the people who will appear to Jesus, Elijah, taken from this world directly into heaven. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah was traveling with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord is taking your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord is taking your master away from you? He said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went down. Then fifty men from the sons of the prophets came and stood and watched them from a distance, while the two of them were standing at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, folded it together, and struck the water. The water divided to the right and to the left. Then the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask me for whatever I can do for you before I am taken from you. Then Elisha said, Let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. He said, You have asked for a difficult thing. If you see me being taken from you, it will surely be yours. But if not, then it will not. While they were walking and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire came and separated them. So Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha was watching and crying out, My father, my father, Israel's chariot and its charioteers. Then he did not see him anymore. He grabbed his clothing. He ripped it to two pieces. The word of the Lord. Amen. Our second lesson is found in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, reading from chapters 3 and 4, where Paul talks about the other person who would appear with Jesus on the mountain, Moses, and how Moses' face shone from being in God's presence. Therefore, since we have this kind of hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. In spite of this, their minds were hardened. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains when the Old Testament is read. It has not been removed because it is taken away only in Christ. Instead, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into his own image, 
from one degree of glory to another. This too is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as a result of the mercy shown us, we are not discouraged. On the contrary, we have renounced shameful, underhanded methods. We do not operate in a deceitful way, and we do not distort the word of God. Instead, by proclaiming the truth clearly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for the last Sunday of Epiphany for Transfiguration is the gospel according to Mark, reading from the ninth chapter. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn number 97, Down from the Mount of Glory.
mercy and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's word for our consideration today is found in our Gospel, Mark chapter 9. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts may it be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. There's just something about mountains that inspires awe. I don't know if it's the immense size of them or the way that they draw our eyes to the sky, but there's just something about mountains. And I wonder if that's why God uses them so often when he wants us to see something important. It was on a mountain, Mount Ararat, where Noah's Ark came to rest after the whole world had been destroyed by the great flood. It was on a mountain, Mount Sinai, where God first appeared to Moses out of that burning bush, calling him to be his leader, his prophet, to bring the people out of Egypt. It was on that same mountain, Mount Sinai, where God again made a covenant with his people, that sacred, solemn agreement where he gave them his word and his commandments. It was on a mountain, Mount Carmel, where God sent down fire from heaven, swallowing up Elijah's sacrifice, proving once again that he was the only true God. It was on a mountain that Jesus taught the people about the kingdom of God, what it meant to be blessed by God. And here today we stand yet atop another mountain. Something God is going to show us today must be awfully important. So what is it that God wants us to see today? What is it that God wants to show us? Today is the celebration of the last Sunday of Epiphany. In a few short days, we transition into the season of Lent. And Lent is that solemn 40-day journey to the cross that takes us to the pinnacle of God's glory. For at the, at the end of Lent, we see Jesus climbing another mountain and revealing his glory like never before in a display much greater than turning water into wine or feeding 5,000 or even calling Lazarus out of the grave. Jesus showed everyone there exactly what kind of God he is. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, that's the only place that anyone ever calls him the Son of God, is when he does this. And I realize we're not even at the beginning of Lent, so why am I talking about the end? It's because that glory is the reason that we're here today. In Jesus' crucifixion, we see the greatest demonstration of God's glory that was ever witnessed by people. That's not to say that stuff like parting the Red Sea, or turning water into wine, or raising the dead as small potatoes. But that's easy stuff for God. He says the word and it's done. God created the entire universe by simply speaking his word, and so it should not surprise us that he's completely in control of everything. But it's at his crucifixion, that's where his glory really shines. Because there we're not talking about what God is able to do. There on that cross, we see what God was willing to do. The one who formed Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life was willing to let Adam's descendants pound the life out of him. There's no greater demonstration of the kind of God Jesus is. It shows us that Jesus doesn't just control the world. He loves it. That he doesn't simply punish those who sin against him. He climbs up a mountain and 
takes the punishment in their place. And that's why we're standing on this other mountain today. Today is not the pinnacle of glory. No, today is just a glimpse. Today is a glimpse that helps us to get ready for the journey ahead. You see, six days prior to today, Jesus had begun his own Lent with his disciples. He had begun to tell them exactly what was going to happen to him when they got to Jerusalem. And understandably, the disciples were having a hard time coming to grips with all of this. Earlier in Mark, we read, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, be killed, and after three days rise again. He was speaking plainly to them. And how poorly did the disciples react to this? Peter flat out told Jesus that he shouldn't be talking like that. The student rebuked the master for even thinking that way. Thankfully, there would be no stopping Jesus. And so now, six days later, we find Jesus taking Peter and James and John up a high mountain to get them ready for the journey to the cross. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Today, we stand on that high mountain, just us and Peter and James and John and Jesus. And suddenly, we see Jesus like we've never seen him before. The veil covering his glory is removed. And for just a moment, we see Jesus in all of his glory. And it's such a bright picture. It's so overpowering that we can't even bear to look at him. And suddenly, it's not just us and the disciples and Jesus, but two men appeared with Jesus. And even though we've never seen them before, we know exactly who they are, Moses and Elijah. And they're talking with Jesus about what's going to happen on that other mountain. And just then when we think we can't possibly take any more, a cloud envelops us all, and we hear the voice of God himself, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And then just like that, it's over. And it's just us and Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus looks exactly like we've always seen him. And down the mountain we go on the way to the cross. So what was the point of all this? Why does God bring us to this mountain? And what does he want us to see? Throughout the season of Epiphany, we've been seeing the hidden glory of Jesus in his interactions with God's people. And that glory is so important in reminding us of who Jesus is and what he is able and willing to do. And it's important that we hang on to that glory as we begin this journey into Lent. That's what Jesus wanted his disciples to do. That's what he wanted them to see, the appearance of Moses and Elijah, the voice of the Father from heaven, the, the brightness of the clothes and the hair and the face all displayed the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. And can you see why God would want to hammer that message home, engaging all of the senses? It's so that they would hang on to it. You see, the disciples were on the verge of seeing Jesus suffer many things, be rejected by the religious leaders who supposedly spoke for God, and eventually be killed. And those things don't exactly 
show glory. Who is going to follow and listen to someone and trust in someone who gets treated this way? That's why God gives them this glimpse of glory. So that they'll remember who Jesus is. So that they'll keep on following him. So that they'll understand what he's about to do. Because the only way that any of this makes any sort of sense is if it's on purpose. If it's part of God's plan. Jesus reveals his glory here so that the disciples could see the glory on the cross. And where is the glory on the cross? It's in the fact that Jesus is God's son and that he's going through all of this for you. For some reason, Jesus is willing to set aside the glory that we see on this mountain, the glory that is his, and take on what belongs to me. And take on what belongs to you. Our sin, our suffering, our death. And that's why he's there. That's why he suffers. That's why he dies. The reason is you. Because he loves you. And that's why God has brought us here today. He shows us his glory so we can hang on to it, so we can remember it, so we can continue to follow Jesus all the way to the cross because that's a hard thing to do. Look at what happened to Peter and James and John. When the time came for Jesus to be handed over to suffer many things, we see Peter at one moment swinging his sword, trying to protect his Savior, and at the next moment denying, swearing up and down that he even ever knew him. When they see Jesus die, they run and they hide and they lock the door. Three days later, when news reaches them that Jesus has risen, they run to the tomb to see it for themselves. And when they find it empty, they have no idea what's going on, as if Jesus had never told them anything. And then they run back and hide and lock the door. If they had only hung on to the glory. And they would have seen the glory. What kind of God Jesus is here on this mountain. And they would have, on the cross, seen what kind of God Jesus is and what he is willing to do. If they had only hung on. Friends, that pattern continues to repeat itself among Jesus' disciples today. When it seems like God has turned off the glory and has left us hanging. When sickness lingers, when temptations resurface, when family strife appears, when things aren't going according to the plan, then our doubts aren't so much, so much about what God is able to do, but rather our doubts revolve around what God is willing to do. To do. And we focus all of our attention on what we think God's not doing. And we forget what kind of God He is. It's not that God has turned off the glory, it's that we've let go of it. That's why God brings you here today. When Jesus says, I forgive all of your sins, I love you, I will always be with you, everything that happens I will work out to bless you, those aren't empty words. This is God talking. The same God who created the universe, who parted the Red Sea, who called Lazarus out of the grave, and he didn't stop with the easy stuff. 
He's the same God who set aside all of that glory for an even greater glory, who set aside what belonged to him to take on what belonged to you, to be punished by God and to be killed by God on a cross, all on purpose. All for you. All because he loves you. God has brought you here today for a reason. Look at what he's able to do. Look at what he's willing to do and hang on to that glory. Hang on to that glory that you see here today and then you'll be able to see the glory on that other mountain. The mountain we call Calvary. Hang on to the glory. Our journey to the cross begins today. Please stay. Now may that peace of God which surpasses our understanding may keep you in your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. This time we take a few moments to remember how richly God has blessed us and to give thanks for the opportunity to return those blessings to him. Continue with the prayer of the church. We praise you, O Father, for the precious gift of your Son and for his glorious transfiguration on the holy mountain. Give us the firm resolve to listen to your Son, the eager readiness to believe his promises, and the joyful willingness to heed his commands. By the sign of Moses and Elijah, show us that blessed are the dead who die in faith, for they shall know the power of Christ's resurrection and shall be changed from glory into glory. 
O God and Father, let your Holy Spirit find a dwelling in our poor bodies and transform our weak, sinful lives into the radiance of goodness, purity, and righteousness. Transform our minds, our understanding, our judgments, yes, our whole persons, to reflect the mind of Christ. Take our sicknesses and pain, our disappointments and despair, our sorrows and mourning, our pride and anger, our selfishness and envy, our hate and fear, take all of these, O Father, and transform them by the healing touch of Jesus into noble impulses, pure motives, kind thoughts, constructive deeds, high courage, and true faith. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. Look on your church, O Lord, here and in every place, and grant that we and all who bear the name of Christ may daily offer up to you the acceptable sacrifices of repentance, thanksgiving, and loving obedience. Hear our prayer, and by your mercy grant our petitions for Christ's sake, who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll conclude our service by singing hymn 96, A Wondrous Type of Vision Fair. <laughs>
cusp of the season of Lent, so starting next Wednesday, we will have midweek Lenten services at 3.30 and 6.30. Um, there will be uh, no meal in between, but you can pick up a meal and take it home with you. Mr. Heller's um, making soups and sandwiches for those meals. Uh, when you're, the menu's listed here. You also see it on the uh, sandwich board outside, uh, the cost of those and what you can get. Uh, you can sign up for those by uh, contacting Amanda in the church office. Um, I think we'd like to have those in like by the Tuesday before so uh, Mr. Heller can make sure he has enough for those things. So that starts next Wednesday, 3.30 and 6.30. We'll continue to have our Thursday night services uh, all throughout the season of Lent. So uh, this has become your, your weekend worship opportunity. You'll still be able to have that uh, going forward. With those Wednesday services, we are looking for some volunteers to help with the screen and also with some ushering. Uh, so if you're able to, you know you're going to be there on those Wednesdays and be able to help out, that would be great. Again, just talk to Amanda uh, in the church office. I believe the rest of the announcements you can read for yourselves in the bulletin. God's blessings on the rest of your week. Let me get to the back and I'll wave at you on your way home. Thank you.